Hello everybody. In the hot, humid, tropical climates or in the setting of a chronic, debilitated patient, fungus is an important etiologic agent for infectious keratitis. So once again, I welcome everybody for this topic on fungal keratitis. I am Aravind Roy. I am a consultant at the Cornea Institute, KVC campus, Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh from India, from LD Prasad I Institute. Before we start this series, could you please indicate the type of your practice? Okay, thank you. So most of the attendees are in the comprehensive or in the training phase of their careers and I'm sure you will find this disease very relevant in your clinical practice. So the objectives of our talk today are to understand the burden of fungal keratitis, the predisposing risk factors, common clinical presentations, the microbiology and the management aspects which includes both the medical and the surgical management options for the treatment of fungal keratitis. Infectious keratitis is very relevant in the developing world, especially in the Southeast Asia, as well as in all the hot, humid, tropical, subtropical climes. The reported incidence ranges from 11,030 to 7,990, which actually translates to 840,000 new cases of corneal ulcers every year in India alone. Now, if we study the prevalence of fungal infections, both in terms of the smear positivity as well as the culture positivity from this publication from Aravindai Hospital in Madurai. You can note these curves of the fungal positivity in the smears to be progressively higher and significantly higher than the bacterial uh, smears as well as the cultures which show that there is a significant culture positivity too. And amongst the organisms that were positive, it was found that Fusarium and Aspergillus, which are basically the hyaline filamentous fungi, are much more prevalent. And fungus is a significant proportion of all the infectious keratitis that present to the ophthalmic clinic. If we also study the trends in the pediatric keratitis, fungus also forms an important part of the spectrum. There are distinct seasonal trends in microbial keratitis and so also for the fungi. And we see in a study which was conducted in South India as well as in China that there is a seasonal prevalence of more amount of fungal keratitis seen in the winter and also in the monsoons. When we look at the predisposing factors which may predispose to a person getting fungal keratitis, Probably trauma with vegetative matter or people who are more employed in agriculture, agriculture based activities or in manual labor are more predisposed to fungal keratitis. That said, there are certain systemic conditions which also predispose the patient to fungal keratitis and this includes having a history of uncontrolled blood sugars or diabetes and any unsolicited corticosteroid topical usage. Usually these patients present within a week to two weeks of the manifestation of their symptoms. And this study on fungal keratitis conducted in-house at LV Prasad Eye Institute listed out all the important ocular and systemic risk factors for fungal keratitis. And it was found that prior surgery and lag of thalmos were some common ocular risk factors and diabetes was the leading systemic risk factor for fungal keratitis. When the patients present, they present either with a topical antifungal which was prescribed elsewhere or often with a combination with antibiotics. And a combination of antibiotics, antibiotics, antifungals or over-the-counter medications which also have a steroid often confuses the clinical picture. However, there are certain very classic pictures of the fungus when we see it on the first visit. And typically, it's a very dry looking ulcer. It has an indistinct feathery fuzzy margin 
there may be a ring infiltrate and some satellites as you can see in this case there is a classic ring infiltrate that is building up with a very dry appearing lesion with ill defined margins so often they tend to progress without response to the antifungals and they may need a therapeutic graft which is what is the final treatment for these cases in case they do not respond to medical management alone this is another case where there is a plaque like presentation and a convex shaped hypopion in a pregnant lady and it progressed very fast leading to rapid perforation of the cornea and that led to a decision of a surgical management and a therapeutic keratitis a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty was performed in this case she refused any further surgery but gradually the, the graft had a neurotrophic keratitis and it led to a central graft melt and this was the final picture with a neurotrophic graft and a pseudocornea and a perforation in the graft she refused uh, keratop uh, the tarsography which would have certainly avoided this kind of a clinical presentation however because she was in an advanced uh, pregnancy she Uh, refuse further intervention as far as surgery was concerned this was another classic case which presented with a microbiology negative again diffuse margins a dirty convex hypopion and a lesion which showed some amount of melting and thinning over the infero infero nasal cornea there were no predisposing factors and at the outset one would probably think that are we dealing with fungal keratitis especially because these such cases are so very common in our our clinical scenario however as a protocol it is recommended that one should not treat fungal keratitis unless there is a microbiological evidence this is important because fungal keratitis tends to have a chronic long term course and unless one does not have a definitive evidence of the fungus it is important that you do not start antifungal drugs and this patient was started on a broad spectrum empirical therapy and this was the resolution that was noted in two weeks time which clearly proven that this is a microbiology negative possibly bacterial keratitis so these are some of the fallacies when we look at fungal keratitis and the other important factor that is a differential in fungal keratitis is also hsv stromal keratitis because that's one big differential where the clinical picture is very confusing however the points in favor of hsv are that there is a history of repeated recurrence a much more chronic duration fluorid vascularization areas of scarring and footprint scars which help the clinician distinguish between fungus and virus this was another case of a 71 year old male with a two week history and no antecedent uh, history of injury with any vegetative matter or so forth so a penetrating keratoplasty was performed because this was a chronic ulcer and it was not responding to medical management alone the grafts often tend to fail as is the case with a hot keratoplasty meaning a keratoplasty that is performed in the setting of a infection and they may require a further surgery and this was done in this case where a cataract extraction and a dissect was performed which finally led to graft clarity and resolution of vision in addition to hyaline fungus candida or yeasts are also important etiologic agents in fungal keratitis in a study from our institute we found that candida albicans and candida paracelosis are two other species that commonly infect corneal and they may present as keratitis these etiological agents are usually responsive to amphotericin b or caspofungin or voriconazole as can be noted in their mic 50 and 90 values and when we do a e test with a methylene uh, with a muller hinton agar with glucose and methylene blue the minimum inhibitory concentration is quite high in a lawn culture of candida as can be seen where the amphotericin as well as the itraconazole voriconazole and caspofungin show a significant zone of inhibition around the strips that are placed in the center of the plates the other important etiological agent 
in the setting of fungal keratitis are dimorphous fungus these are basically pigmented fungi and in a saburodextrose agar they grow as fluffy cottony blackish colonies and when a slide is prepared with lactophenol cotton blue wet mount we can see that there are filamentous hyaline septi and conidia which have a brownish to blackish pigment typically these ulcers may also present with a fair amount of pigment around it which hints that probably we are dealing with a dimorphous fungus usually there are several species that come under dimorphous fungus however this could be the commonest that have been isolated from several large series including one large series in house from lvpei was carvularia and bipolaris this is an important slide which shows the outcome of infection with dimorphous fungus and uh, usually the commonest fungus that is recovered is carvularia and the first line treatment for these infections is natamycin usually they heal well with a fairly reasonable good visual recovery a few percentage of patients although although are referred for a penetrating keratoplasty or may have a poor outcome and need to be eviscerated but by and large they respond well to antifungals the basic microbiology of corneal ulcers remain the same irrespective of whether we are dealing with bacterial or fungal keratitis now this includes a smear using a calcofloor wet mount gram stain and gymsa staining and culture with solid media and liquid media the solid media consists of 5% sheep blood agar chocolate agar potato dextrose agar saburo dextrose agar and the liquid media constitutes of thioglycolate broth and brain heart infusion broth to report as fungus positive either the corneal scrapings should reveal fungal elements in the smear or there is growth of fungus from more than one medium in the presence of negative smears or if fungus grows in a confluent manner at the site of inoculum on a single solid media or fungus grows in one media with fungus in the smears these are the criteria in which a report of fungus positive comes from the microbiology lab and if we look at the sensitivity and specificity of fungi when we compare gram gymsa and koh we see that it is a fairly sensitive and specific to detect fungus meaning that if you get fungus in the slides that means that a fair amount you can be fairly confident that you are dealing with fungus as the only etiology in these kind of ulcers the normal ocular flora has a biodiversity and recently next generation sequencing has helped us understand that what proportion of this normal ocular biodiversity changes in health and disease so this paper talks about how the ocular microbiome changes when there is a infection especially when there is a fungal keratitis so these bands actually tell us which genera are present in the normal ocular microbiome in healthy individuals where a swab has been taken and there is a lot of unclassified fungi that has formed and when <clears throat> we take smears from patients who are suffering from fungal keratitis we see that there is more of aspergillus less of the unclassified fungi and when we take corneal scrapings and subject them to the next generation sequencing again we see similar patterns of more of aspergillus and other fungi as opposed to the unclassified fungi so that means that the possible etiologic agent is populating and also it is pushing out the other fungi that are part of the normal ocular microbiome and this is how the normal ocular flora responds to a disease and this helps us understand the burden of the disease when clinical studies were done on the type of fungal keratitis and the infective organism it was found that hyaline filamentous fungus is very common in our part of the world and they constituted predominantly of fusarium 
and aspergillus and this was seen both in large studies from south india as well as in north china confocal microscopy is another important tool wherever available that aids the physician to make a diagnosis of fungal keratitis this is important because often the corneal infiltrates may be mid to deep stromal and therefore they are not amenable to scraping or we could not get access to provide a sample to the microbiologist as regards to the etiology so the picture on your right is the confocal image of a normal cornea so what we see in the figure a and b are the anterior and the posterior stroma where the keratocytes are noted the figure c shows the single monolayer of the normal human corneal endothelium and the figure d shows the nerve plexuses which are present at the subbasal level figure e and f shows the large stromal nerve fibers which are of 10 to 15 microns and these sizes actually help us guide to detect fungus or any other foreign body or any other pathology that may be there in the diseased cornea so as we can see in the in the subsequent slide these are the confocal images from a patient of fungal keratitis and here we see that the fungal filaments appear as highly reflective double walled septate filaments the dimensions are 3 to 8 microns which means that they are of the same dimension as the subbasal nerve plexuses and they have a lot of irregular branching of uniform width and when we see this kind of characteristic clinical picture we are reasonably sure that we are dealing with fungus as the probable etiologic agent there are a lot of antifungal drugs that have been recommended for usage in fungal keratitis broadly they have been classified into polines azoles pyrimidines and pyrimidines and echinocandines so the polines and the azoles inhibit the cell wall synthesis the pyrimidines and the echinocandines inhibit the thymidine and glucagon synthesis thereby affecting the metabolism of the fungus leading ultimately to the cell death so when a study was conducted to study the antimicrobial susceptibility of filamentous fungus it was found that caspofungin and the triazoles were much more effective because they have much lower minimum inhibitory concentration and as you can see in the mic 50 and 90 values they are significantly lower compared to say natamycin and it was found that the newer drugs are much more sensitive in killing the fungus however does that actually translate to clinical benefit and to study that a very important trial was conducted this was a level 1 evidence which is which found that the natamycin which is one of the polines was actually significantly better than voriconazole in managing filamentous hyaline fungi the mycotic ulcer treatment trial is a landmark study that helps us understand which drugs are the best or probably are the first line in the management of filamentous fungi and we found from we understood from this study that natamycin is the single best first line molecule in the management of filamentous fungus and cases that are treated with natamycin had significantly better three month best corrected visual acuity than voriconazole and they were less likely to have perforation or require a need for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty a follow up of the mycotic ulcer treatment trial was the mycotic ulcer treatment trial 2 or the mut 2 as it is called and the study question for this was that whether additional oral voriconazole was beneficial when we are adding that to a regimen of topical antifungals for treatment of hyaline filamentous fungus and this study conclusively proved that there is no additional benefit of adding oral voriconazole to a patient who is being treated with topical antifungal eye drugs intracameral drugs have also been in vogue and there have been several anecdotal reports about the use of intracameral agents in the management of deep seated corneal mycotic keratitis 
the technique consists of injecting voriconazole into the mid to deep stroma usually a dose of 50 micrograms in 0.1 ml is administered in divided doses all across the lesion it is important to see the fluid wave in the corneal stroma once you inject the drug and that is the guide to the completion of the treatment so as it is being shown in this representative video voriconazole is being injected all around the lesion and the hydration of the cornea lets us know that we have uniformly spread the drug into the cornea and usually one to three injections are repeated at 72 hour interval and before we declare that whether this is an effective treatment or we should progress to other surgical modalities such as lamellar keratoplasty or therapeutic keratoplasty as regards to the evidence for or against intrastomal voriconal voriconazole injections these two papers provide a lot of insight initially the thought was that intrastomal voriconazole tends to help the resolution of recalcitrant and deep mycotic keratitis however a later study from the same group found that there is no additional benefit of intrastomal voriconazole when topical voriconazole is given to a regimen of topical natamycin for deep mycotic keratitis therefore the verdict is still out and probably it is recommended to use these modalities of treatment on a case per case basis and not really as a standardized uniform protocol a further study that was recently published also found that it is better to have a global approach or a holistic approach in managing fungal keratitis and this was labeled as the tst protocol which is the acronym for topical systemic and targeted therapy so basically it means that the first line treatment is natamycin undoubtedly in the view of the evidence that has been accumulating over the years and in addition one needs to use systemic antifungals and add topical voriconazole or continue them or add intrastromal or intracameral injections and if there is a poor response then proceed for therapeutic keratoplasty the authors reported a 80% success after following this protocol we also recently reviewed the surgical aspects of managing fungal keratitis lamellar surgeries have been in vogue for quite since some time and this is important because lamellar surgeries are extraocular procedures there is no harm to the host endothelium one can easily take off the sutures in a short post operative course and wean the patient off the corticosteroids and it's also important in a resource limited setting where the you tissues which are of poorer quality can also be utilized in these cases so basically the lamellar surgery or the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty involves removing the superficial layers of the corneal stroma and try to dissect off all the diseased tissue so that can be achieved by a layer by layer dissection or by a big bubble technique so as you can see in this representative video the adult is being performed for a infective keratitis and after partially dissecting into the corneal stroma we try to dissect off all the unhealthy appearing stroma and a big bubble dalk is attempted to bear the desmis once the big bubble is achieved it is important to dissect off all the corneal stromal layers before putting in the graft so there have been quite a bit publications in this regard and a large study from china found that out of 55 eyes that were a part of this study 51 eyes resolved with lamellar surgery alone the histopathology of the button showed that there were fungal hyphae which are aligned in a parallel fashion to the corneal stroma a study from singapore found that about 15% of these cases had recurrences 
and these recurrences were not limited only to fungal keratitis because this study actually talked about advanced infectious keratitis and they included both uh, fungus bacteria acanthamoeba etc and they found that typically all those cases where the desmase was not completely bare in those cases there are some lamella where the organisms might have remained and that led to recurrences we evaluated in the in house study 167 corneal buttons of fungal keratitis and we found that patients who have a heavy fungal load or who have a poor host response or poor response to the fungus usually went in for a surgical option and therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty was performed in these cases the histopathology of the button showed a lot of fungal hyphae in the deeper stromal layers and they were also noted to cross the desmase into the anterior chamber therefore it is important that one needs to dissect off and bare the desmase before attempting any lamellar surgery and in case we suspect a full thickness infiltrate it is important to completely excise the unhealthy cornea and perform full thickness procedures rather than go for lamellar procedures which may predispose to a recurrence the other important surgery in the diagnosis of a deep seated fungal infection is a corneal biopsy this is recommended for those lesions which are off the visual axis and this is a representative video where we have a deep seated corneal infiltrate which is away from the visual axis so it is first important to dissect off the superficial healthy appearing cornea and then from the deeper layers the scraping is being taken and a small block of tissue is excised off from the deeper cornea and this is subjected to histopathology once that has been taken the flap is secured into positions with tenon nylon and when we performed the histopathology we found that there are fungal filaments in the gms stain and the gram stain showed septate hyaline filamentous fungus superficial keratectomy is another procedure which is of use in fungal keratitis because fungi often tend to grow as a plaque on the cornea so often this acts as a debulking procedure and it allows the drugs to penetrate and it decreases the fungal load so this may also help in treating fungal keratitis tissue adhesives are especially important in the setting of a perforation a small perforation where we do not have the need or requirement for a much more aggressive procedure such as a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty so it is important to dry off the area scrape off any overlying epithelium that is there and then apply a thin film of cyanoacrylate tissue adhesive this is important to provide tectonic stability to the globe and once it is done a small air bubble may be placed into the anterior chamber often there might be adhesions which are sticking to the back of the cornea so it is important to sweep the cornea with a blunt instrument and once you have swept off all the adhesions out of the back of the area of perforations a small air bubble is placed into the cornea and it is allowed to heal on its own and a bandage contact lens is placed on top of it sometimes <clears throat> this was a case of a patient who had a corneal trauma and the corneal trauma led to a secondary infection so the air bubble that you see was the air bubble that was present at the initial surgery and there is a lot of tissue necrosis and there are some broken sutures where the infiltrate uh, has allowed the sutures to cheese wire through them so these cases tend to be quite bad with a lot of corneal melting and large perforations so it's important to scrape off all the necrotic debris and then apply a thin film of tissue adhesive over it once that is done one may make a small port or refresh the previous one and then just augment the amount of air that is there in the anterior chamber place a bandage contact lens on top of it and continue with the drugs and allow the 
I to heal before a definitive or another surgical procedure is contemplated. In the setting of non-healing corneal ulcers, because often fungi tend to lead to chronic ulcers, it's important to scrape off this area and place an amniotic membrane. Amniotic membranes are biological bandages and they assist in the epithelialization and healing. Sometimes these lesions require multiple amniotic membrane grafts and they need to be folded or rolled on top of each other and, and allowed to set with fibrin glue. This helps in the healing of these lesions. The other aspect in the management of fungal keratitis is the performing a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty when all other modalities have exhausted themselves. This is required when there is a worsening of the fungal keratitis or there is a non-response to medical management, a corneal perforation, a involvement of the corneal limbus. It is important to first identify the adequate trifine and then refine the area that appears to be infected. Once that is done, it is important to make a controlled entry into the anterior chamber. This is an inflamed eye, therefore it is important to perform more than one peripheral iridectomies. Once that is done, the host uh, bed is prepared. It is important to place the adequately sized donor and secure it into position with 16 interrupted sutures. So this is the suturing that is being performed and at the end the chamber is well formed and the surgery is completed. So sometimes there might be a old perforation or a patient who has had a tissue adhesive that has been in place because of a prior perforation and the lesion has progressed underneath. It is very important to make a very controlled entry in these cases. This is required because there might be some adhesions of the lens iris diaphragm to the back of the cornea. Therefore, a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty may easily cut off the iris too. So it's extremely important to do a controlled entry into the anterior chamber. Once it is done, all the unhealthy appearing adhesions have to be removed. It is important to size the trifines accordingly. It is important to oversize the donor by 0.5 millimeters up to 9 millimeters. And from 10 millimeters and beyond, it is important to oversize the donor by 1 millimeter. All the grafts which use a donor which is more than 10 millimeters, one should use 24 sutures to close the graft. After that, <clears throat> any membranes or inflammatory membranes that are formed in the pupillary axis or underneath the iris needs to be carefully excised. These eyes tend to bleed a lot, so it is important to ask the assistant to gently irrigate the surgical field so that there is a view of the surgical field and we can quickly continue with the dissection before completing the surgery. Once that is in place, it's important to quickly perform the peripheral iridectomies before putting the post corneal button. Sometimes there might be a total corneal infiltrate. It is important to wash the exudates and assess exactly the amount of cornea that is actually infiltrated. So when we see a lesion, something like this, it's important to first make a controlled entry into the chamber and then gently wash off all the exudates from the anterior chamber. So as the wash is completed, we realize that the infiltrate is not total, but it is somewhere within the cornea itself. And that helps us to size the donor and host refines accordingly. So this is the wash that is being done. And once the wash is complete, it's important to irrigate the field, make the, penet the peripheral iridectomies, and then proceed with suturing the host uh, donor button into the host.
This is another such scenario where there is a old standing corneal ulceration. So sometimes there might be dense adhesions at the back of the cornea. So it's important to very gently irrigate them and excise them before proceeding with the surgery. As you can see in this case, there is a dense and thick membrane in the pupillary area. Therefore, it is important to carefully dissect off the corneal lamellae and then make an opening into the pupillary axis. Sometimes the PI may also lead to vitreous prolapse. As you can see in this case, there is a lot of vitreous here. So this is so because this was a old standing perforation and often the lens iris diaphragm is prolapsed forward. In that case, it is important to wait, realize what has happened and do a thorough vitrectomy. Once the vitrectomy is done, it is important to identify that there is no loose vitreous wicks and then proceed with the rest of the surgery. Place a bit of viscoelastic, reform the angles of the chamber and then proceed with the keratoplasty by putting a donor corneal button in place. Sometimes there are long-standing large perforations. So as you can see in this case, there is a large inferonasal perforation. And the moment we lift off the diseased cornea, we see that there is a lot of underlying infiltrates and exudates at the pupillary axis. Often there would have been a perforation and sometimes we see that it's just the vitreous that is sitting there. It's important to identify this and also perform this procedure quickly because the eye is open and the expulsive hemorrhage can happen at any moment. A thorough, quick, automated vitrectomy is performed. And after that, the button is quickly secured into position. It's also important that once we excise off the diseased appearing cornea, a ledge of tissue remains at the margins of the host cornea. So in this video, what is being demonstrated is that this ledge needs to be excised off very gently and carefully. This serves two purposes. Number one is that it does not allow the donor button to override the host cornea. Number two is that sometimes there might be some infiltrates at the periphery and it is important that one should excise all the unhealthy appearing cornea before placing the donor button so that we minimize the chance of recurrence. Once this has been done, it is important to gently wash the chamber, also wash the angles of the eye, quickly perform the peripheral aldectomies before proceeding for the surgery. In some cases, especially those where there has been a perforation, it is important that we very carefully excise the host cornea. This is to avoid injury to the underlying iris, which may be tightly adherent, as you can see in this case. Once that is done, excise off any diseased tissue and the ledge that may be there. After performing this procedure, it is important to check whether there is a complicated cataract that might be there in this case. In such a case, it is important to very carefully remove the cataract. This is important because if there is an intumescent cataract, your chamber will not form. And in that case, it is important that we take out the complicated cataract and allow the chamber to form before proceeding the, into the surgery. In addition to the different modalities that are present, <clears throat> collagen cross-linking in the management of infectious keratitis has been in vogue. This is so because there have been several isolated reports which have found that in end-stage infectious keratitis, collagen cross-linking may help in resolution of infectious keratitis. But when we come to fungal keratitis, the body of evidence has been mixed. There has been Several reports which have suggested that probably in the setting of mycotic keratitis, the collagen cross-linking procedure is not of much help. However, 
a randomized controlled trial which was recently published in ophthalmology found that there is very minimal benefit of collagen cross linking in the setting of fungal keratitis they used four subgroups for this study where natamycin and amphotericin b were given alone as well as with collagen cross linking and the effect was studied and they found that there was no improvement in microbiological cure infiltrate or scar size the percentage epithelialization or the adverse events in those groups who have been subjected to collagen cross linking vis-a-vis -vis those groups where collagen cross linking was not done therefore this gives a reasonable evidence that in the setting of fungal keratitis collagen cross linking is of not much help so with this i would like to thank my colleagues and fellows and we can take a few questions before we end the topic for the day thank you very much so let's go with the questions one after the other so how important is the role of scraping and staining uh, by the way are you also seeing the questions on your screen too as i am seeing them so everyone can open them on their own screen but um okay. yeah everyone can see them okay great so scraping and staining is extremely important as we discussed in this slide on microbiology the sensitivity and specificity of almost all the scraping procedures are in their 90s which mean that if we get a fungal filament on the scraping then we are reasonably sure that we are dealing with fungus as one of the etiologic agents and because fungus tend to have a chronic course it is important that we have a evidence of the disease before we embark on a treatment therefore this is extremely important to have a simple test as a 10% koh wet mount which has a reasonable degree of sensitivity and specificity before proceeding with treating fungal keratitis steroids are absolutely contraindicated and uh, they are not indicated in the management of fungal keratitis in fact unsolicited steroid use is one of the risk factors for a poor prognosis in fungal keratitis the third question is that of a patient who had undergone amniotic membrane transplantation and has a desmetoceme if the patient is a fungal keratitis and if the duration is so long as 6 months it is probably useful to provide the options of a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty to this patient keratectomy as a treatment of fungal keratitis has been fairly useful we have reports where there have been successful resolution because sometimes the fungus spreads as a plaque on the superficial cornea therefore superficial keratectomy when performed in a controlled manner actually debulks the infection and allows the drugs to penetrate into the remaining cornea and assists in the resolution of fungal keratitis okay so the other question is on a rural setting so in a rural setting i would say that if you can arrange a basic microscope which most labs or most pathology microbiology labs in the laboratory settings have them and if you can use a inex such a inexpensive thing as a 10% koh wet mount there is a 90% to 94% probability that you will pick up fungal keratitis and this is more important because most of the patients of fungal keratitis are act either agricultural workers or patients who have sustained a vegetative trauma which is so much more common in a rural setting and therefore you will actually increase your probability of treating them adequately if you perform this simple test of a 10% koh therefore it is strongly recommended that it is doable and it should be done in the rural setting especially so the clinical difference from bacterial keratitis is that fungus appears as a dry feathery plaque like appearance with the presence of a ring infiltrate and sometimes there might be satellite lesion so this helps us distinguish fungus from bacteria other than keratoplasty we discussed all the options it could be a kerato 
lamellar keratoplasty, it could be a superficial keratectomy, tissue adhesives, etc. Pythium is an emerging disease. Pythium looks very similar to fungus and unless carefully sought after, they may appear as hyaline tubules in the wet mouth. However, they are not septate. The clinical picture is been described as peripheral gutters, tentacle-like, dot-like infiltrates, and they typically do not respond to antifungals. And if you suspect pythium, it is best at this point of time to refer early to a cornea service. As these patients need specialized treatment and sometimes they also do require a penetrating keratoplasty. <clears throat> The primary tests that we should do is a 10% KOH wet mount and where you have access to a microbiology lab, subject the scraping to both solid and liquid media to allow for any growth. So if there is no availability of corneal scraping and staining, a basic lab microscope which is available in any lab or any medical school with a 10% KOH tablet, which is usually available in any chemist, you can make your own 10% KOH and keep it in a cap bottle. Usually this remains fresh for a week. So you need to make it once a week, put a little bit of the scraping directly in the center of the slide, put one drop of the 10% KOH, put a cover slip and see this under a low power microscope. Any low power microscope can help you look into a corneal 10% KOH wet mount and presence of filamentous fungi, which are very common in our setting. It can help you diagnose that and start adequate treatment. So it is really very simple to get it done. I'm sure if you try it once and see representative pictures on the web or from uh, relevant lectures or uh, studies, I'm sure you will be able to catch and have a more definite uh, treatment for your patients. 24 suture graft. So <clears throat> this is a good question. Actually up to 10 millimeter of the donor cornea, we use 16 sutures, but whenever the grafts are larger than 10 millimeters, 24 sutures is recommended. This is because the larger size will not hold with 16 sutures. And very often you will see a dehiscence of the graft host junction or there will be a prolapse of iris and a shallow chamber through the lesions. This is because a large graft needs 24 suture or sometimes 32 sutures for tectonic stability. Corneal tattooing, I don't believe this is relevant to the current uh, topic that we are discussing. Therefore, it will be beyond the scope of uh, this talk. So preserve the lens and keep it fake. Absolutely, one should try to preserve the lens wherever possible. In fact, if you would have noticed the previous few videos that uh, we were discussing, the lens is actually kept intact and it is important not to lose the lens because often lens expulsion is associated with vitreous loss, which actually worsens the prognosis of a penetrating keratoplasty. However, sometimes because in the setting of a perforated corneal ulcer, there might be a complicated intumescent cataract. So in those cases, it is important that the intumescent lens is removed because if it is not done, it is almost impossible to form the chamber. And if you somehow do form the chamber, we also see these patients come back with the lens sticking to the back of the graft and a very raised intraocular pressure. So it's really important to identify this condition and wherever possible, very carefully remove the lens and try to form the chamber. Intracameral and intrastromal injections. So as I discussed during my talk, they are, there is a lot of evidence which goes both in favor as well as against the use of intracameral drugs. Probably it is important to understand that this is one modality of treating fungal keratitis and you may want to use them in deep mycotic keratitis, but not 
as a protocol because studies have found that it is as good as giving topical voriconazole as opposed to giving uh, intrastomal voriconazole so the evidence is still out the verdict is still out and probably one needs to use it on a case to case basis how do we treat after keratoplasty uh, in fungal keratitis the protocol is to use <coughs> the antifungal drugs for at least 2 weeks after the surgery to check the margins and check whether there is any residual or recurrence and once you are sure that there is no residual or recurrence start corticosteroids as your topical treatment this is important because when we treat medically we see that the complete resolution takes 2 weeks until scarring before the fungi is eliminated from the area of infection therefore two weeks is the uh, ballpark figure on which we decide when to start topical corticosteroids post keratoplasty for fungal keratitis confocal is not really a diagnostic tool that is available to a lot of people therefore confocal where available can be used and it also needs a fair bit of expertise to perform confocal because it is it touches the eye patients tend to be apprehensive and often there is a lot of noise meaning there is a lot of high reflectivity from the inflamed tissues and it is useful in deep mycotic keratitis where the lesions are not amenable for scraping the next question is that should we scrape under the slit lamp yes we do scrape under the slit lamp and in this we place a drop of topical anesthetic such as proparacin 0.5% allow the patient to be comfortable place the patient in the slit lamp and use a bard parker's uh, handle with a number 15 surgical blade or a kimura spatula and take a little bit of sample for inoculating into the different media the uh, next question is that do we prefer to start one medication or uh, should we combine them the first the mutt trial showed that the best molecule that we have at hand right now is natamycin therefore natamycin is the first line treatment in the management of uh, fungal keratitis and then as subsequent studies have also shown one can also combine different other modalities and uh, observe the response to that so steroid is absolutely contraindicated in fungal keratitis therefore if you are dealing with a case of fungal keratitis you should not use topical corticosteroids as this worsens the prognosis and allows the fungus to spread the protocol for cortical steroids after keratoplasty is just as we discussed we wait for 2 weeks and we give antifungals for 2 weeks after therapeutic keratoplasty before starting topical steroids there is uh, no role of topical and systemic antibiotics in the management of uh, topical in the management of hyaline filamentous fungal keratitis uh, this question also we just discussed that in addition to the antifungals we may give cyclopregics but uh, apart from that uh, we do not add any other medications antifungal medications are uh, fairly commonly available in those areas of the world where fungal keratitis is a important public health uh, problem therefore uh, it should be good to discuss with your regulatory authority where fungal keratitis is important to make availability of antifungal drugs especially topical antifungal drugs these are fairly inexpensive and uh, probably it should be available in the pharmacy where you practice in case you do have a lot of fungal keratitis in your practice so topical treatment uh, <clears throat> so natamycin as we understood from the evidence from the mycotic ulcer treatment trial natamycin is currently the single best molecule for the treatment of hyaline filamentous fungus corticosteroids are absolutely contraindicated and therefore they should not be used in the management of fungal keratitis 
only when one has performed keratoplasty and after two weeks of natamycin when there is reasonable probability that there is no residual and recurrence then one can start with topical prednisolone when once you are sure that the fungus is eliminated but until that time there is no role of corticosteroids in the management of fungal keratitis there are no the next question is that is there any research on anti inflammatory topical which prevents melting no unfortunately none uh, we do use uh, oral doxycycline because they inhibit the tissue matrix metalloproteinases and they can be advised in patients who have corneal melt topical antibiotics are uh, not required in fungal keratitis the empirical treatment when you get a microbiology negative is a broad spectrum antibiotic so we use a combination of uh, fortified cefazolin with ciprofloxacin or fortified vancomycin with ciprofloxacin or some patient, some people also do use moxifloxacin as this is a newer generation fluoroquinolone with a broad spectrum for gram positive and gram negative bacteria we do not use 2% povidone iodine as a topical treatment therefore i do not have experience with uh, this uh, line of management all right thank you dr roy um i think this might be a good place to stop unless yes okay so thank you everybody for joining in it was great interacting with all of you and uh, we really appreciate your interest in this topic in case you do have further questions do write in and we'll try to address your questions too thanks a lot for your great support lawrence and the team at cybersite it's, it's always great to feature on this forum and uh, uh, speak to attendees all across the globe thank you very much